Hey everyone, welcome to the pod where I, myself, Mike Lee, interview my everyday friends who have hidden talents beyond their regular nine to five day job. Today's first guest on the very first inaugural podcast is my good friend, Danny Fan, photographer, Korean thumb extraordinaire, and the one woman who, in my opinion, redefines power in the word power tools. Uh, welcome <laughs> to the pod, Danny. Hello, thank you for having me. I literally just came up with that introduction probably at least like 10 minutes ago, and I was trying to figure oh, out no. what's the best way uh, to, you know, introduce you and hype you up, right? Like that is what uh, a podcast host is supposed to do. I suppose that is true. I've done a, a few interviews myself, and I say you brought the enthusiasm. And I appreciate okay. it. You, you can definitely use that line, right, whenever you make a grand entrance somewhere else. <laughs> Uh, so for context, we know each other through a Japanese immersion uh, program, or I would just say study abroad program, uh, where we stayed in Tokyo, Japan mm -hmm. for about a month. Uh, she and I became really good friends over the course of the trip. We uh, partied together, went clubbing, um, and we did you know a lot of like tourist stuff uh, as well. Like we hung around kind of in the same group, and you know that group of friends we see each other about. I don't know, once a year, maybe more. Uh, it's kind of like an annual thing that mm -hmm. we do together. We don't see each other all the time, but that's like the the one time that we do have uh, a friend's reunion. Uh, we, as of maybe like pre-pandemic, like three, was it three years ago? We went to uh, Japan for a 10 year anniversary. So time flies. Yes, we did. Uh, really, really fast. Yeah. Uh, before this, I was looking at all of your Instagram stories featuring our trip just to reminisce. A little bit as I was doing research, uh, so I will be very, very <laughs> transparent uh, about that. But yeah, it's I want to like totally notice you stalking that. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. It was just like, well, if I'm already going to do the research, I might as well just go down memory lane, and maybe that'll jog something. But I really want to get into how like your, you know, upbringing really led to kind of like your do-it-yourself entrepreneurial mindset. And the reason why uh, this was really interesting to me is because like you do a lot, you have a lot of like crazy hobbies, right? Like you do photography, mm. uh, you have donkey media, right? Uh, you have, mm. um, you do weddings. You used to do weddings and photography, home reno, uh, yeah. just all these like, uh, you know, really interesting everyday hobbies, but I feel like you take it to another level. Uh, and so I feel like the experience that you have <laughs> is like, really interesting that I think if people wanted to to learn more, uh, that they would actually really be able to learn a lot from you. Oh, well, I don't know. I, I joke to my coworkers that one of my hobbies is to find more hobbies and get into other hobbies. Um, that in itself, I think, uh, is, a, is an approach that I have that's very unique to me. Um, but in terms of my upbringing, um, I think it's even my childhood home, I would say, uh, was a fixer upper. I heard stories of uh, my father buying the the house that they did, and it was run down. They said that my mom's words were the grass were so tall in the backyard that you would run into the lawn and disappear. And I was like one or two years old, and they found like garden snakes. Um, and it's not like we this was a rural area. This was generally an urban suburban area. Um, but my my parents had a vision, specifically my dad, on like. Um, how things can transform over time and how he can put, you know, sweat equity into the home and uh, make it something valuable. And I think um, my partner, Charlie, we agrees with this, where um, you learn more about your home and you cherish things when you work on it yourself. And I think, um, and now owning my own home, uh, doing a lot of it myself has definitely, I agree that that's something that's really helpful um, to do. And you feel a sense of ownership, I think. Cool. Uh, as, as a fellow homeowner myself, I definitely feel that to a much lesser degree. I'll, I'll give an example where uh, I wanted to install a smart thermostat and, you know, you're kind of doing things trial by fire uh, a little bit in terms of mm -hmm. what are these things that I need to hook up, right? Like uh, what is a, for example, what is a C wire, right? It's like, I don't know. I have to go to mm -hmm. YouTube, look it up, plug it in. Does not work? Oh, maybe I should go to the electrical <laughs> panel and you know see what I should do there. And I just remember feeling that it was super satisfying to actually just like finish something so small and minuscule. It's like, wow, 
I spent three hours saving a hundred bucks. Like that's pretty much how much expense or like how much it would cost to have, you know, a contractor come in and, and install it. Uh, but mm -hmm. I know that you guys have done, you know, obviously much grander things. Um, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but I kind of want to go back to uh, your dad's vision of kind of like the house and the fixer upper, like uh, how did, I don't know if you've had the chance to ask your dad this, but like, how did he end up choosing that specific house? I'm sure there were, you know, other fixer uppers that he potentially could have uh, chosen, uh, oh, yeah. but just want to know a little bit more about um, why your parents chose that specific fixer upper. Oh yeah. I, they, I do remember that my, my dad said that he really loved it because it was in a quiet neighborhood um, and it was a cul-de-sac and we were like literally like one or two years old when he first bought the house. And he said um, to my mom that like, he imagined us riding our bicycles there um, and, and how safe would it be? It was walking distance from the elementary school. And so those are some of the elements that felt was important to him, not only the house itself and the land, but also the surrounding neighborhood. Um, particularly because it was like in a cul-de-sac, he knew that it was like less likely to get um, like, uh, what was it where like things would big um, retailers or something would move in or to get become high traffic. Uh, he felt that that particular area wouldn't. Um, so my grandmother's house, for example, it was is on kind of a main street. It's actually where my parents live now, um, and that has gotten really dense and loud. Um, so it, it's, it is something that you have to kind of consider. Uh, long term, and uh, that's kind of some of the decisions that we put into our house, or the the things that we thought in putting into our house too. Got it. That's interesting. It seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that seems like it's something where, for your dad, that that was his uh, vision of the American dream, right? Like where you said he was. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, your kids could bike around uh, the neighborhood, a quiet, safe place, mm -hmm. a suburb huge house i'm assuming i mean it's a sub it's like you know a suburb urban in an urban ish i guess urban suburban ish area it's hard <laughs> to kind of describe mm -hmm. uh i mean it is in orange county uh so primarily yeah. suburban for the most part uh but yeah is that do you think that that's part of like the american dream that he sort of had you know for uh for you and your siblings oh yeah totally Prior to this, I think for some a little bit of context, my my parents are refugees from the Vietnam War, um, and so when they came to the U.S., um, my mom, for example, her family, they all crammed in. She's one of eight, and so all of them lived in a uh, two-bedroom home in Long Beach. So you can imagine cramming eight people into a two-bedroom home. Uh, it, it definitely was a big deal being able to have their own space and have a, a nuclear family structure in a home environment. That was, I think, the quintessential American dream uh, in the 80s, early 90s. Sure, I can definitely see that. Uh, would you say that mm -hmm. when they were thinking about their vision, uh, it was enough to house, I guess, you know, how much of your family? Because you said they were one of eight, right? So, you know, was it intended to mm -hmm. be like a multi-generational house where, uh, you mm -hmm. know, you're, okay. Yeah, it was the it was the dream was like uh, it would be enough rooms for each one of us. So it would be my parents with their own. It was like for them, it was like so much space because then it was a a four bedroom home, and then it was them, and then my older brother, myself, and my younger sister. We would later have another sibling, but <laughs> that was a, a bit of a surprise for them later in life. <laughs> Call it an oops baby, as my friend would say. Yeah. yeah fun surprise <laughs> uh so you know growing i'm assuming you know growing up in southern california orange county right like talk to me about uh you know kind of growing up uh as the the daughter of vietnamese refugees um and just how mm. that upbringing like really influenced uh not only just like your attitudes towards uh you know, like photography and DIY and entrepreneurship and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so walk me through that a little bit, because I think that uh, experience would be something that's really interesting to people. Um, sure. I mean, definitely growing up, there were different uh, responsibilities, I would say, um, between when I'm comparing myself to, to my brother uh, in terms of like duties around the house, expectations. Um, and that really was something that, 
me personally, I uh, kind of was kind of, I recognized at an early age and kind of rebelled and, um, and still to this day, still <laughs> rebel in many ways. And I will always challenge like, why should I expect to like um, get married or have kids? Um, but we'll get to that later. But I, sure. I definitely think that that caused me to be a little bit more, um, what's the word? Um, rebellious, daring, and like willing to explore things on my own um, compared to like other folks maybe. I can definitely see that from just our general friendship. And, uh, you know, it, I think maybe it takes on a little bit more of a tamer form, uh, generally speaking, but uh, I can mm -hmm. definitely see those those qualities and, and characteristics. Uh, so you went, you ended up going to college in uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, right? Oh, yeah. 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 So, so tell me a little so, bit about how that, like, you know, also influenced, like, you know, the photography the, I'd probably say at least the photography mm -hmm. aspect of it, from my understanding. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Now I like now I'm feeling the vibe. Okay. So, um, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do in terms of school. There was definitely a lot of expectations that because I was, I, I was, I performed really well that I should become a doctor, a lawyer, something of that nature. Um, during my high school times, when that's kind of like the decision, or what seems to be when you make these big decisions <laughs> at that time. Um, I really got into photography from my brother giving me my first camera and, and incidentally, my, or like, we went through a lot of interesting things. My grandpa passed away. Um, and then I also recognized the lack of like Asian American representation. So the combination of me just not only like documenting my life and my family made me realize like, oh, it's, this is something that, um, I, I'm curious if I can get into for that, um, and so I wanted to go to school for film and media, and I was torn as to if I wanted to go in for like production or for theory. And in my mind, I learned a lot of, I learned a lot of things like from simple HTML to like Photoshop and photography on my own. So in my mindset, I was like, I can learn production on my own, like, but I, I'm not one to learn theory. Um, that's something I think I need to be taught and I should probably go to school for that. And so that's what led me, um, so you consider UC Santa Barbara, which had a very good um, film and media department, but focusing more on the theory as opposed to production like that of like, well, like UCI or UCLA and um, Cal State Long Beach had a more robust production program. So that's kind of one of the reasons for that decision. The other being, um, so I lived in like a very predominantly um, Vietnamese American high school. And so when I went to go visit the, UC Santa Barbara campus. I my brother said that uh, no, my mother turned to my brother and says like there's not a lot of Vietnamese people here. And my brother said I think it matches the American demographic a little bit better. Um, and and then that, and from that statement, it made me realize that like I'd probably be good for me to get this experience <laughs> early on um, and understand and navigate that. Um, and it was also away from home, so uh, those are kind of like my three reasonings for picking uh, UC Santa Barbara. And I do not have any regrets in that decision is probably one of the best decisions I've made. Got it. Uh, there's a couple things that I think that I want to kind of focus in on. So you mentioned uh, your grandfather passed away, right? And that when you were handed mm -hmm. the photographer or the, the camera for the first time, like what are the things that you decided to capture, right? If, uh, you know, knowing that uh, you wanted to record more memories of your family and, and things around you. It was, it's like very simple. I think it's um, just something to hold and to have. And I think there was also a lot of reinforcement from my friends and family, like, oh, we should print this out. Or like, oh, I want a copy of that. Um, and then I, I would also be filming videos and stuff. And um, for fun, I would like shoot music. What I was basically like um, my friends and us doing things, but to music. So like our own little music videos and stuff. And then, um, I think that community reinforcement was very helpful. I even made like a DVD of like all oh, the, nice. the shenanigans we did in high school. <laughs> I even ended up selling for a profit copies of the, those DVDs. <laughs> that that is that is your entrepreneurial mindset. And I guess your, your can do rebelliousness uh, really kicking in. <laughs> yeah. And the internet allowing me to buy uh, CDs and DVD cases. <laughs> nice. Nice.
Yeah. So yeah. I know you mentioned the film and media theory, right? And what are some of the things that like, mm-hmm. cause you said you went, uh, the theory part is what you wanted to learn at uh, UC Santa Barbara because you felt like you could do mm-hmm. the production stuff, right? Uh, on your own. Yeah. So what is cause... it about the film and media that uh, you really took away and apply, even apply it maybe to now, right? When you look at uh, art and photography and all that stuff. Um, just like the, the meaning behind that, what you could be filming and t- documenting. Because um, I definitely think that earlier on when you're still learning, you're, you're, there's a lot of playfulness. But even now, I think uh, we can recognize in, in media, like the importance of uh, representation and, and how, what you say and how it can actually really affect people. Um, so that was something that I, I was kind of recognizing, but I didn't know how to put into words. And I th- figured that like studying the theory would help. Got it. Sounds good. Um, so I guess with the theory, right? So it sounds like it's more about uh, how to best express yourself and what kind of like uh, impact you want to leave to the audience that you're you know, potentially mm-hmm. giving this to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I, that led me to taking like um, a lot of courses that were like international. So I took like a Chinese cinema class which was also really fun um and like a por- pornography class which was interesting and which also led me to studying abroad in japan so because it was at nice. the tokyo film school that is true it was a film <laughs> school uh i obviously did it for very different re- reasons other than film school it was more <laughs> to fulfill a humanities uh requirement uh for the most part so not to say that I, I wasn't interested in the film stuff. That stuff was very interesting, uh, but just slightly different reasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do want to go back to uh, when your mom was mentioning like, oh, this fits the Santa, UC Santa Barbara fits the American demo. Like, I was wondering uh, if you could actually like explain that a little bit more, right? Like from your mom's perspective, like what does it mean when she says the American demo? So it was actually, so my brother is the one that said that. Oh, sorry. Um, I apologize. So my mom was concerned. Yeah, 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 yeah. My mom was concerned that because there wasn't a lot of like Asian Americans, there were going to be people that like, oh, I'd be like, um, what's the word? Um, at a disadvantage or something. Um, but I definitely took it as a challenge. And I did, wanted, definitely wanted to lean into the discomfort <laughs> and into the, the unknown and new. Um, and I think my brother recognized that not every everywhere in the world is like Southern California. It's like uh, Los Angeles or Orange County. Um, and that, you know, it'd be interesting to have this experience. Got it. So I guess from your experience in Santa Barbara, I guess getting to experience as your, your brother would call it the American demo, right? Like <laughs> what is like, how did that kind of shape, I guess, your worldview knowing that like, you know, I think, uh, you know, it sounds like your mom was really worried that there weren't a lot of Asian Americans and you're going into a, a, mm-hmm. an area that I, I'm guessing is predominantly white, right? For the most part in terms of yeah, white yeah, yeah. demographics. <laughs> uh, I mean, let's, yeah. like, let's, not, let's not beat around the bush around that. Um, but yeah, I was just yeah. curious about <laughs> like that kind of experience because uh, like for me, like I've always been around you know, Asian demographics, right? Whether it's here in the Bay Area or going down to UCI, right? It's actually going even more Asian. Mm -hmm. Um, But I would say for me, like in high school, I was actually pretty fortunate to go to a school that was actually pretty diverse where it was, you know, it was Asian, Mm -hmm. it was white, uh, black, Latino. um, So it was all kind of a a whole smorgasbord. So I feel like for me, that was uh, a good experience, but I definitely have seen where, uh, you know, some of my other friends who maybe not have haven't had experienced that kind of diversity or just like something outside mm-hmm. of your own demographic, like uh, it is definitely a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I believe when I was a student there, it was about nine percent, eight or nine percent were Asian American. That was the student body at UCSD. And then it has since increased. Um, and I, it's really funny because I do remember um my second year there kind of feeling nostalgic and homesick uh, which led me to join the Vietnamese Student Association which is also another um, reason another like source of a lot of my close friends to this day (laughs) so besides the study of my group 
Um, that was like one of those other things that I, I joined and became active in, um, joined as like um, a historian and then became president uh, my senior year there. Got it. So by you joining uh, kind of this Vietnamese student association, like it sounds like you were able to still maintain like, you know, uh, a connection to uh, your culture, right? Like that seems like something that was really important mm -hmm. to you um, as well. Yeah. Cool. I want to know a little bit more totally, about how yeah. those kind of networks, uh, whether it's like a Vietnamese student associations, like how those kind of uh, helped build kind of your network, right? Of friends, right? And like, mm -hmm. you know, brought in your sense of community because it it's kind of ironic if you think about it, right? Like uh, if your mom is worried that there's not enough, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Asians, right? But then by being connected to, <laughs> you know, more, more Asians or I'm assuming more Vietnamese, you know, Americans as well, mm -hmm. uh, that actually expands your network. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, like, yeah. You know the Vietnamese Student Student Association. They have you know wide networks not only just in Santa Barbara but also uh, mm -hmm. at other college campuses as well. So it's almost like the yeah. uh, the opposite sort of happened, right? Like you actually expanded like the <laughs> exactly. Vietnamese American network. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know it's really funny and ironic how that happened, um, and it was really interesting too because I would say also because there was such a small demographic of Asian Americans. Um, my the Vietnamese Student Association was actually not strictly all Vietnamese students. So we actually had uh, even when I was president, half of my cabinet uh, was not Vietnamese. So we had folks from all all Asian cultures uh, in the club uh, participating, just like because they enjoyed it and it felt like a safe space. Um, and there were friendships and and you know adventures to be had <laughs> in joining. Got it. Totally makes sense. Um, speaking of ventures, I do want to kind of get into beyond the college stuff. Uh, you mm -hmm. participated in a Cambodian like kind of adventure or documentary. Uh, and so that's something I kind yeah, of yeah. want to like explore a little bit because I remember when you mentioned that to me, it must have been maybe like two years at the time we had graduated or something like that, like pretty early mm -hmm. on after college. Um, and so I just remember that that was something that was like, wow, like, you know, you're really putting to your film major like to use. This is like what film majors <laughs> like, you know, dream about, right? Like, you know, grassroots on the ground, right? Like uh, kind of activity. Yeah. So tell me a little bit more about kind of how that came to be. And like, how did you guys even yeah. think about like, we're just going to go to Cambodia and we're going to, you know, just do a documentary. And can you explain what that documentary actually is? <laughs> Yeah, and it was not at all glamorous, y'all. <laughs> it definitely was not. It was funny. So I had a coworker who I went to UCSD with, uh, worked on their master's thesis, um, building a water wheel or water drum for easy transportation, and an NGO, nonprofit, um, picked it up and was interested in doing some trials in Cambodia. Uh, conversations led to a bigger concept of like how can we um, kind of document and share with other people about the work that's being done. And so I was invited to to fly over um, and kind of document their work. And their idea was based on like, if a community um, can, the idea was that a lot of orgs come in, throw money, build wells, and then peace out. And usually those things get degraded um, and ultimately doesn't help the community in the long run. Um, and then uh, this organization, Community First, their concept was like, if we um, build like the community around it, um, build like the uh, committee or the network, and they can eventually um, be self-sustaining in their, um, in everything. So from water to food and agriculture to uh, uh, health and small business. And so that's something that I went over to document. It was definitely one of those life-changing moments because at the time uh, folks would be walking miles and miles to get access to water and it wasn't even clean water it was like uh, usually murky had pesticides uh, would cause illnesses there was a high child mortality rate also high level of diabetes just because there wasn't a lot of uh, shelf safe stable foods so people relied heavily on rice um, so we went and we just documented what was going on and the work that they were doing 
it did not like win any awards by any means. It did not go into any film festival circuit. It ended up being definitely used a little bit more for fundraising. Um, and it actually did what it was set out to do. They raised enough money to build wells for all the communities in the area. Um, and then a few years later, we did a follow-up and that area now has electricity as well. And they, because they have the, now the access to water and electricity, they've started to do aquaponic systems. So they can locally grow their own uh, meats and their own produce uh, on the comfort of the home. And the area is unique in that a lot of men go off to work in uh, other countries like Th uh, Thailand and stuff to do construction. And so this community is predominantly young women um, it led and, and managed. So it's, it's really interesting to, to see a lot of women and uh, create these aquaponic systems for the family and start businesses. Um, so from that definitely made me feel like that I could do it myself because I'm very blessed to live in a place where I do have access to water and I do have access to electricity. So there's no reason for me not to do, to grow my own food. Totally makes sense. I can see where that kind of uh, inspiration uh, comes from. Uh, one thing I did note mm -hmm. as like kind of an observation is how important uh, developing the infrastructure actually is. It's not just, hey, like you said, plop it mm -hmm. in, right? That's it. It seems like uh, by considering the infrastructure and also the network that it was able to mm -hmm. uh, local, I wouldn't say localize, culturalize like this, the solution, right? Uh, to fit their mm -hmm. needs versus just like, here's this thing that we built you know, in isolation and we're bringing it over and mm -hmm. like, here you go, right? And the fact that uh, it was yep. able to grow really from, uh, you know, getting clean water. Now that that need has already been met, they could focus on electricity and the hydroponic system, right? Mm -hmm. So I, that is just something yep. really interesting to note, like just the, you have to build the entire ecosystem uh, around a specific mm -hmm. uh, new uh, I wouldn't say invention, right? But like around a tool and it has to yeah. be, you know, for contextual uses uh, relative to what people actually really need. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, this, you mentioned that like it was a really impactful time in your life and uh, that, you know, it made you feel like that you could really do anything. Uh, would you say that that is something that really kicked off like your entrepreneurial drive? Uh, I would say that was already kind of like going since I think working in high school and creating DVDs for my friends and being able to monetize that. Um, so that I think um, the documentary thing definitely made me feel comfortable in trying new things. Got it. But I wouldn't say that that like started my entrepreneurial spirit. I say, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I but just definitely wasn't sure whether helped it's me like find my love it. for yeah, I would say that it was definitely helped me find my love of like uh, growing my own food and my interest in like regenerative agriculture and stuff like that. And that's definitely, that's where that started. Got it. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit since that is a great launching point towards gardening. Uh, so, you know, I was you know, <laughs> doing a little bit of research and, uh, you know, you're growing Mustard green, celery, beets, Chinese broccoli, carrots, cilantro, lemons, avocados, sugar canes, beets, uh, four different types of cucumbers. I think like three different types of strawberries. Uh, you're interested oh, yeah. in grafting, right? Like, uh, you know, on, I'm assuming onto a tree or another branch. So that is quite the large amount. And I'm sure there's probably even things on that list, right? That didn't even like... Uh, mm -hmm that aren't even, I didn't even list. So you basically are running your own community farm at this point, or what it almost sounds like. <laughs> I mean, it's not a community farm unless it's enough to feed a community or share with more people in my community. That is something that I like have been learning more about and like definitely luckily that I, I'm really good with like my neighbors and stuff like that. And I've given produce to um, like extra produce to them and they've enjoyed that. Um, but yeah, that is something that I'm working on and hoping to make even bigger, but definitely small steps. I've only been on this property for like a little bit more than a year. And I think right now it's mostly the vegetable garden that's producing, but when the fruit trees are producing, that's when it's going to be popping. <laughs> Got it. Like 
take me back a little bit in terms of like, how did you really get into gardening? Is this something that like you learned from your family? Is this more you're learning mm. from other friends or maybe it's through YouTube, right? Like what kind of in- help inspired and give you, gave you the confidence really to, you know, get into gardening. Cause there's a lot of people that are like, Oh, like they are lightly interested in gardening or maybe they just want the end product, mm. which is like a nice flower that's already pre-built or I should mm-hmm. say built like, like basically already grown and you're just taking the fruits of someone else's labor. But, you know, you are growing these from scratch and, you know, these are very diverse uh, plants that you are growing with all their different needs. Uh, so just kind of yeah. talk to me about, uh, you know, where that all sort of came from. I think that I, it could also stem from like been my family being immigrants and like wanting to have um, food and produce from home. Uh, I think there's actually a exhibit over in Houston, Texas about this, but a lot of Vietnamese Americans growing a lot of their own herbs, because it's not something that you would normally find in um, mainstream big box uh, grocery stores. Luckily, we do nowadays have more Asian groceries all all over the coast. But I I imagine that there was a time where it was difficult to find. It was much easier to grow some things on your own, like um, fish mint, perilla, those things are in the mint family. Those grow like weeds if you can just get them started. Um, so we always grew up with uh, those particular items and um, and if we could get their hands on it, it's always helpful to grow things that, you, that what they were nostalgic for. I remember my mom was telling me that we were eating, uh, I think it was jackfruit, uh, I think last year. And she was saying, she was telling, which is funny because like to me, we have jackfruit all the time. But she was saying when we first came to the US, the cost of one jackfruit like not even a whole one, just like half of one was worth an entire month's paycheck. And like, it was, it would be so expensive to have. And if, if only they could grow something like that, they'd probably do it. <laughs> well, we luckily do have, we, uh, we haven't done it yet, but there are some people trying to grow jackfruit. And similarly, like, um, like even as simple as bananas, which to, which I mean, like the cabinet bananas that we have in the store are like not as good as like some of the OG bananas um, in other areas of the world. And my grandmother, she also like loved bananas. And that's something that um, was con- for them considered too expensive um, when we first, when they first immigrated to the States. So being able to grow things, especially if they're hard to find uh, like dragon fruit, dragon fruit, like to me, it's so easy to grow. All of my family has it, but well, definitely when they first came to the US, it was so hard to find, it was so expensive. Um, so I think that was important to them to, if they could, to grow as much as possible because um, you can get that in the stores. And then like my grandmother, I think is the only one that was really into growing um, florals. So we all, I remember always watering roses and it was my grandmother who was like really especially <laughs> um, on top of nagging me uh, to water the rose bushes. Um, and so in my parents' new home, they didn't plant any rose bushes but that's the first thing I planted in my the front yard of my of my own home was like I want some rose bushes I feel nostalgic for my grandmother so that's kind of like a call to her a little dedication to her (laughs) some nostalgia there yeah I was like that's super symbolic right like it's just something where it's like Mm -hmm. you know when you were growing up uh and to put that into your new house right it's it's almost paying homage Mm -hmm. right to to your grandparents Mm -hmm. a bit so that that is yeah. very uh, brings tear to my heart, uh, touches a string. I know I'm definitely planting banana trees because it can grow here. If I can find a good jackfruit, that is a maybe, but that's also very dangerous. <laughs> do you do you think? Because uh, you were talking about how it was harder to find specific like nostalgic uh, plants uh, and foods, right? That you know your parents couldn't get mm-hmm. that they in the U.S. you know at the time, and we're probably what talking about like the. 70s and 80s or something 80s, like yeah, that 70s, 80s yeah. uh, mm-hmm. where you know that cross-cultural cross I don't know trade between Asia and the United States for specifically Asian oriented things uh, you know probably wasn't as robust as it is I assume now like I'm sure probably now you can mm-hmm. find you know those things right so uh, much stuff in a yeah. supermarket but I'm assuming that they're also kind of expensive relative to obviously what they're used to growing up. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So do you think that like that anchoring effect is kind of like, hey, I know I could have gotten this way cheaper, obviously in, you know, whatever, Vietnam. <laughs> and it's just like, there's a sense of yeah, yeah. pride of saying like, well, I can grow it myself. And I don't have to pay that money. And it, they'll probably say like, I don't know, it tastes better. Like when you grow it yourself, even though it it's, takes like a hundred percent way longer. There's like a sense 100%. of pride. <laughs> I will, I will agree to all of those things. It definitely, um, there's a sense of pride because it's like taking ownership. You, you actually see the progression and you have, there's the anticipation of like, man, when these beats are done, I'm going to rest them and be so hyped. <laughs> there's, um, so there's definitely that um, you're revitalizing the soil, uh, helping the planet. Uh, and also it tastes so good. Um, if anybody, if, if you haven't had the chance to taste locally fresh grown stuff, uh, I recommend going to the farmer's market. I remember because there are still some things that I, I, I'm not as experienced at. Um, I only recently started growing celery, but I remember um, buying celery from the farmer's market for the first time and eating them like, this is the best celery of my life. Even carrots. I was like, this is the best carrot of my life. Why aren't we eating like, why aren't all carrots like this? And when you learn the system of like how things are often shipped from out of state or from wide, far distances, the quality, the second it's picked out of the ground, it starts to degrade. Um, so the sooner Makes you sense. can have it from, um, picked from the ground and onto your plate, the better in terms of plate, in terms of taste, but also in terms of like nutritional value. Uh, talk to me about that piece a little bit when you're saying that there's a difference in taste. Mm -hmm. Like I have this anecdotal sort of reasoning about uh, the difference in when you eat a food, right? Let's say for example, you're eating a carrot mm -hmm. and when you eat a carrot, Mm -hmm. like you eat a carrot that's i don't know i'm not gonna say generic but just like your run-of-the-mill carrot right it tastes like yeah. a carrot if you taste the best yeah, carrot, carrot ever still tastes like a carrot but it's like the 10 to 5 like whatever the five like whatever the five to ten or whatever it is like that extra two percent right of some part of that taste right is just much better mm -hmm. and that i don't know extra 10 to 20 percent difference is what commands you know, like uh, demand, right, for that specific, uh, you know, mm -hmm. plant or whatever. And I just feel like it does take a certain level of appreciation for like, you know, you have to actually enjoy eating a carrot, right, in order to actually want to pay more for oh, it. Oh, yeah. Right. Like if you don't like carrots, it's just mm -hmm. like you're not going to appreciate like this is an sure. organic, you know, carrot and, you know, it's going to taste better. It's like, no, it still tastes like a carrot, but there's just mm -hmm. that subtle difference that like, feel like it's a very refined palate. I don't think you have to have a, I don't actually, it's funny enough. I don't think I have a very refined palate. I think my palate's garbage. Um, okay. And um, Charlie, Charlie, my partner, he has much more delicate refined palate, but like I noticeably notice a difference um, between like um, the bottom of barrel carrot versus like the locally grown carrot. It's so good. It's the, I would, the way I would say is like the, <laughs> For carrots specifically, I wouldn't say it tastes better. I would say it tastes like one bite of carrot has the taste of a thousand carrots. In Got one it. Bite of okay, carrot. so it's like <laughs> enhanced. It's a stronger flavor, mm -hmm. like a stronger essence of that specific flavor, just mm -hmm. in a one bite versus Correct. like yeah. a weaker flavor of it. Okay, that makes sense. I, yeah. I could see that in terms of flavor. Yeah, and then for potatoes, to me, like my homegrown potatoes are much more fluffy. Um, for like tomatoes the tomatoes are much more juicy and it so it's like it varies from plant to plant um but i think it's well worth it <laughs> i mean that makes sense uh for a lot of the plants right that you're talking about uh like roughly how long does it take to go from like seed to harvest right are these like anywhere from i don't know a month right to an entire year mm -hmm. right like talk to me about like all of all the things that you've kind of, or I've listed out, right. Uh, from, you mm -hmm. know, the mustard greens, whatever to the like strawberries and, you know, potatoes, mm -hmm. right. Like kind of, is there a classification for how long kind of these things take? Like, just so that if someone was interested in growing these things, like, it's not like, Hey, I'm, I'm waiting for 12 months and nothing's shown up. It's like, <laughs> oh, you have to wait 12 months. Right. Oh, yeah. Like, what is that expectation? Like, yeah. And you don't have to wait till months. There's like, um, and there's a great, there's some great movement too. Like you really, you, you can't eat some of the seeds on their own. And so you can eat something as, there are people that eat sprouts. You can eat 
um, microgreens of a lot of um, produce out there. So people eat microgreen um, broccoli or microgreen beets and, and stuff, and they'll put it on in their sandwiches. I've done that. We've eaten Charlie and I've eaten a lot of microgreens in a lot of areas uh, where there might not be a lot of sun. That's definitely a, a great food source to get your uh, veggies is to grow microgreens, and you can get that in like two weeks till and in two weeks time. You can also do sprouts. You can put seeds. And, you know, in that case, you might not even oftentimes need that much sun. You can grow sprouts in like an uh, old milk carton container on your on your countertop and uh, get bean sprouts that way. So <laughs> it can, you can get you can get stuff in your belly pretty quickly, uh, depending on what form you're, you'd want it. So if you're talking about sprouts or microgreens, you can get that in like two weeks time. If you want uh, herbs, you can get that. Herbs, leafy greens like lettuce. Um, grow pretty quickly and can be harvest um, a little bit after there's some some true leaves um, things like that do bear flowers and fruit will take longer and will have more requirements um, so they'll require usually more more sun uh, and they'll have a longer growing period and so that will take longer but once you get this going depending on the plant they could um, they could last all season long or they can even come back the following year I live in an area where um, I can overwinter eggplants and I can overwinter um, peppers. So like once you get them established, they can come back year after year. Makes sense. I mean, I can't imagine it ever really gets cold in Orange County. So it's not like you really have a true winter per se. It's, it's a blessing and a curse though. So there are things that I find challenging to grow because um, it needs more of a cooling temperature. So for example, um, I haven't had a successful like big brassica family success. So I have grown Chinese broccoli, which is like small stocks, but I haven't grown up a, a whole head of broccoli or a whole head of cabbage um, be, sim because simply it gets too warm too quickly here uh, in my area. I should probably start as early maybe as uh, September, October next year. Um, but that makes it challenging. So even like uh, lettuce can bolt and go into seed right away in my area. Cilantro is another one that uh, wants to turn into a, a flower and seed right away uh, because it gets so hot. So there are some challenges, but you can build microclimates uh, and try to keep certain plants cool, provide shade. Uh, so that's something I'm constantly learning uh, about my about my land. Cool, cool. Um... We'll get into the land in a little bit because I know that there was a lot of work <laughs> involved on that land. But uh, I do want to ask, right? Like, you know, if you could give any advice for, uh, you know, planting stuff for people who maybe don't have as much as a green thumb, like, what is the kind mm -hmm. of advice that you would give to one, make sure you don't kill your plants, right? Uh, and then two, <laughs> Uh, what are some, you know, easy, uh, I'm not even going to say flowers, right? Like I would say like, what are some easy, mm -hmm. uh, what's the best way to, to, to say it? What are the easiest, like, you know, plants and veggies, right. Or like fruits and veggies that mm -hmm. you can grow, or even let's say, say root starches, right. That you could potentially grow, uh, mm -hmm. either, uh, indoors, right. Cause not everybody has a garden mm -hmm. like outside or outdoors. Yep. So something that's really flexible for either one. What was the first part of the question? The first, first part of the question is uh, how do you like... make sure that you don't kill plants, right? Like how do you keep them alive? Okay. Like yeah. what are some basics <laughs> around that? Mm -hmm. And then what are some easy fruits or vegetables that you can grow uh, indoors or outdoors that don't, that either or uh, uh, require, like don't require a garden, like outdoor patio or whatever, like mm -hmm. you can have indoors or can mm -hmm. also uh, thrive outdoors as well. Yeah. So in terms of killing your plants, everybody kills plants, no matter how green your thumb is. Even professional farmers have prop, crop failures, even like folks with greenhouses that make your house plant. I believe it was like, like something as high as like 30% of those plants die before they even get to like Home Depot. Uh, so everybody kills plants. It's fine. It's, it's okay. <laughs> don't, don't feel bad about it. Don't think that uh, you don't have what it takes, you know, a seed already has everything that it needs to get going. Um, you just gotta just help it along. And if it doesn't make it, it's totally fine. Uh, so that would be my first advice. I my second one would be, um, you know, 
so the way I started is I started growing succulents first because those seem to be an easy gift that people get um, from like weddings or or things like that Um, and that that started my life uh, and I've definitely killed a lot of succulents surprisingly Um, but after a while you'll you can like level up to new things so for myself it was succulents and then I started herbs and then um, I started more flowering fruits and vegetables like tomatoes and that's actually the same progression that I would recommend somebody would be to start with like uh, herbs and leafy greens because they grow fairly quickly and they don't need as much sun uh, don't have as much of a requirement and once you get comfortable with that honestly you might get super excited and like hyped and you're like I want to try this and that and that's exactly what happened to me if you have more limitations um, like I mentioned earlier you growing sprouts or growing microgreens um, could also be a route that you can go into. The only downside is that usually you require more seeds to do that, but you do get the benefits pretty rapidly. And that's sometimes all you need is to, to have enough, like just uh, one good success, just to keep the momentum going. Um, I had to have to a lot of people that have me all the time, like, oh, this works, I should throw a bazillion of these now. <laughs> that's how, uh, how that can happen. But that's what I would recommend. Um, and then another thing is, um, if you can get familiar with what grows natively in your area, because um, that's something that honestly can grow almost like a weed because it's where it's meant to grow. So for myself, I'm in Southern California. So there's a, a lot of native plants, like in terms of flowers, there's poppies, there's lupines. Um, and then for edibles, you know, we have ro- wild roses that we can get rose hips from. We have sages, we have salvias. And, um, plenty of things to start with if you just want to start with native plants. Awesome. I think those are all like super good tips. I do like that you laid out like succulents are like the, you know, one of the harder things to to kill, um, but as a good starter plant, which I would also uh, agree with, um, you know, going all the way to like herbs and roots and stuff like that. So I can definitely see that progression there. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me about how, uh, like proper water drainage and fertilizer is also like, is that mm. also impactful when we're thinking about like trying not to kill plants? Because, you know, some I know that there <laughs> are times when, you know, we tend to overwater, right? Or we are watering, you know, yeah. at, a, uh, at a regular cadence, but, you know, maybe mm-hmm. we've watered it so much and we've grown a lot of other plants out there that uh, on the same soil, right? That, uh, you know, mm-hmm. the soil is just not as powerful anymore. So, I uh, just want to get your take on water drainage and uh, fertilizer mm-hmm. as it you know impacts you know just regular home uh, home gardening in general. <laughs> it's interesting. So um, as I mentioned, when I was in Cambodia, they were growing things hydroponically um, or aquaponically, and there are in often cases no soil, no um, the medium was either it was gravel essentially, and they were all, almost always wet. Um, so some would argue you can never actually, um, overwater your plants so long as it has good drainage. Um, oftentimes the issue is, so even water itself actually carries, uh, H2O roots need oxygen. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes an issue could be that there's too much, there's actually too much woody material or compost, um, breaking down in your potted plants or, uh, in your, in your soil, which sometimes people just use purely compost. And as things are breaking down, it actually depletes the amount of oxygen. Um, that actually ends up being the, the cause of root rot, not necessarily the water itself. Got it. Um, so it's, yeah. So in those, which I actually only learned like recently, y'all, <laughs> this is um, something that in watching, looking at my own land, I'm very blessed to have sandy loam, uh, which is pretty well draining. Um, and then uh, most plants can thrive over that. You just need to put some compost on top and then don't have to work the soil too much. There's no digging involved uh, in a lot of what I do. Um, so in that, so, in, so from that approach, uh, just making sure that, you know, your your roots are getting enough oxygen, either with good draining uh, drainage and that you don't want to just bury the, it in compost because that actually could have surprisingly negative effects. The compost is meant to be on top because like, you know, in nature itself, um, dead fruits and plants and veggies are usually on the surface. And I believe it's uh, that's where compost and fertilizer should be for the most part. Um, that's my philosophy there. Um, 
Um, so that's so I think that's something that's and there's actually a YouTube series by Laguna Hills Nurseries by Gary Matoka, and he does actually a really good deep dive about soil structure um, and that concept as well. Um, awesome. I'll, I'll drop you the link and you can put in the show notes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, we'll definitely feature um, yeah. Laguna Hills Nursing for sure. Uh, yeah, I would say, so I know you mentioned how that goes kind of outside because you're talking about like the the sand the sand I forgot what you said the sandy something the the sandy foam sandy or loam sandy loam <laughs> sorry yeah um, as I'm assuming that's like the you know there's the soil right and then there's you know sand mm-hmm. underneath so that's like the water drainage for like all the water that goes past the soil stuff like that yeah but let's say you every don't have, every okay. com- every like combination has like there's um every i guess planting area or combination it's usually a combination of it's all it's usually a a different level of sand silt and clay um and i just happen to have one where it's a little bit more of the the sand uh than the clay side um but still has really good drainage um but everybody everywhere has kind of the combination of the three in some some form just different percentages Makes sense. Uh, where I wanted to go to was uh, instead of outdoors, right? Let's say you are trying mm-hmm. to plant something in a, a pot, right? And, you know, mm-hmm. you don't necessarily have, you know, the sandy loam or the clay or anything like that. Like, you know, how do you ensure that uh, you can keep those or one, I guess, try to recreate or two, like, how do you ensure that those kinds of elements can still be successful in an indoor setting where, you know, that obviously is mm-hmm. not necessarily readily naturally available? Yeah. It's funny because like for the me now would be if I'm doing a potted plant inside, I'm very, I know what I have. So I would personally just like dig up my backyard and then just right. <laughs> plant in the plant. But like if you're in an apartment, off. let's say you're um, like, I don't yeah. know, in New York, yeah. right. Or somewhere it's like, you can't just like mm-hmm. break the concrete and just like, all right, time to dig up the totally. dirt. And I don't even know how good that dirt would be anyways, just because of all the stuff on top. Uh, but just want to get your take mm-hmm. on that. So uh, I would, there's so many different blends out there, but I would recommend just essentially, so for like the, where the roots would live, you'd want a combination of either of um, something that kind of like can hold the soil structure. So either a peat moss or a cocoa core. Um, there's like pros and cons about either peat moss comes from like uh, bogs, either um, I think for North America, it's mostly from Canada. Um, so it depletes the, the bogs there so are, some people argue that it's not a, a sustainable renewable source um, but a lot of people are used to it and it holds uh it, it holds moisture and it does a pretty good job most people are familiar with it um there's also cocoa core which is a little bit new um primarily it's um what's uh it's leftover material from uh coconuts that's shipped over from um uh southeast asia and south asia uh, it usually can have some salts in it and so it has to be washed. So some would argue that's also an issue because more water has to be used to use uh, to have it readily available for gardening. So again, pros and cons, I would recommend people do the research and make their own preferences. Uh, I have a little bit of each um, and I'm still learning to see if there's any benefits there. But again, I'm very lucky to use the land I have. So you use something like that and then you want something that will help aerate the soil. Um, so um, you can use uh, perlite, or you can use, uh, some people also use pumice stones, uh, or combination of both, uh, for that. And that should get you going for like the soil structure and then fertilizer or compost on top. Got it. So what you're saying is like, if I have, I don't know, a cup, right. Or a mug, right. That I'm not going to use obviously for drinking, right. Like I would mm-hmm. imagine that it's okay. It sounds like it's okay if you don't necessarily have like a hole because most pots have a hole for drainage, right? But what you're saying is like, mm-hmm. you just need to make sure that you have some harder substances that, you know, provide a little bit more air so that the water has a place to kind of like uh, not sit in the soil for the most part. Yeah. Is that, is that but it, I think it would also, it would be good to have, it'd be good to have that drainage hole. Uh, okay. I actually do not have drainage holes in all of my stuff. But I've, I've. It's only the ones I feel confident in doing so. Um, 
But okay. some plants, yeah, if they can sit in water. Um, but it's nice to have that drainage hole as, I guess, a little bit of insurance. I've grown um, lettuce and some leafy greens in a cracky hydroponic style, which basically it's a bucket of uh, hydroponic water okay. <laughs> and you just put a plant in it and it grows on its own. And it does really well. Um, and there, in that scenario, there is no soil. It's just a bucket of water. So Got it. Yeah, I'm actually, funny thing is I'm actually looking at one right now. It was for Chinese New Year, I believe. And like they sell kind of those like bamboo, uh, I guess like stalks uh, where you just put it in water and it just like grows like the, the leaves. And uh, yeah, it just sits in water. I see the roots everywhere. Um, so I know that mm -hmm. it definitely works out. Uh, a lot of the things that you were talking about actually uh, – kind of translate over actually to orchid growing a little bit, uh, surprisingly, because mm -hmm. it actually doesn't really, for orchids, right? Uh, I will say the common misconception is that it has to be potted in soil, right? Like it obviously needs air, uh, infrequent watering, uh, fertilizer mm -hmm. also very important because if you don't have soil, like you need to have the, the roots and stuff, like absorb everything. Uh, so much to the point where I guess, my mom was actually killing her orchid, right? Because she didn't take it out of like the plastic <laughs> wrap and giving it enough air. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'm in the middle of rehabbing um, one of her orchids. It's not flowering right now. Uh, it was kind of yeah. pretty weak from last year, but the the stems are definitely growing and it's growing, you know, a new set of green leaves. So uh, it just reminded me of a lot of the stuff that I'm already doing for the orchids um, already, just mm -hmm. with like drainage and, aeration the peat moss uh like all that stuff so it was a, yeah it was a helpful reminder. i imagine that you're probably growing it primarily in like um with like bark or something like yeah it, it, it arguably doesn't have a lot of soil it's just bark because i natively i believe it just grows kind of like on the bark of a tree the yeah, exactly the they're more like vines yeah I would say so yeah mm -hmm. no soil uh there's a mix of peat moss which to absorb some of the moisture keeps it uh, a little mm -hmm. bit cool um uh, and then definitely some wood chips and stuff like that to give it yeah. some more aeration because a lot of times when you're mm -hmm. buying the orchids they already look good like when you buy them from the store uh but mm -hmm. oftentimes like the roots are really constricted uh, because it's meant to be mm -hmm. like that for packaging, as well as the peat moss is there to make sure that the roots just don't fly everywhere. Um, but the, if you have too much peat moss, uh, it ends up like cutting out all the air, right? Because there's it's basically just used mm -hmm. as packaging material. Yeah. Cool. And peat uh, moss, I, I think, is also yeah. I think inherently. I think it also has an inherently lower pH, which some people like. So if you're using, if you're trying to like grow blueberries in a pot, you might want to use um, peat moss over coca cola. Uh, describe to me what the pH level has to do with a growing environment. Oh yeah, there's so it's, pH is like levels of acidity. So it can be more acidic or it can be more alkaline. Um, your soil can have a pH level um, depending on the plant. Some prefer um, a lower pH level, like blueberries and hydrangeas, they tend to prefer a more acidic soil. Um, and then some plants might prefer something a little bit more alkaline. Um, and then, but everything else could be usually pretty much in the the neutral zone and and be, and flourish. But um, I think the level, I'm not, I don't know the technicalities to it, but the essentially like the the level of pH makes it easier for certain nutrients to be uh, readily available to the plant. And some plants need some different nutrients as opposed to others. So um, usually um, that information can be easily found with a Google search. So if you're, sure. if you're growing something that's new, you can do a Google search. That's what I often do and how like I'll plant certain things together that might need certain um, nutrition. Blueberries being the biggest one where you know, being known for more desirably um, more acidic soil. Got it. Uh, speaking of like nutrients in the soil, uh, do you have any, you know, kind of tips on how you can use sort of everyday foods, right? To really, you know, power up the nutrients uh, in terms of whether it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe it's like rice water or like kind of things like that, things that you're already naturally going to soak, right? But like, let's say if you don't have fertilizer yeah. or you need to like, 
uh, add more nutrients to the soil, right? Like what are some easy ways, mm-hmm. like what are some easy ways that someone could, you know, basically have like this like super powered water that's really good for your plants? Yeah. So that's something I'm actually still learning about. Um, some people will basically take certain greens and make their own natural fertilizers at home. A common one is like a weed fertilizer. So like when you, it's like picking up all the weeds that you have in your house, um, soaking them in um, distilled or like neutral water and having it sit for a while and ferment, uh, break down and then using that water, diluting it with more water and then using it on your plants. Um, there are some folks, I'm still learning the recipes and stuff too, where for example, they'll take um, carrot tops and they'll ferment that specifically for a specific um, nutrient value or soaking bananas using that for a specific nutrient value. So that's something that is available. Something, another easy, I think more and broad entry level is making your own compost. Um, there's so many different ways you could do it. There's worm composting, so getting a worm bin and then filling it with some browns, browns being like carbon material, like cardboard boxes or like shredded paper or like dead leaves and then mixing it with like your your kitchen scraps, like your veggies and your produce. So like when you're prepping your your vegetables, anything that you don't use, you can put into the compost and then have some worms um, break it down um, and increase the population and continue to eat. I think it can eat its body weight in like 24 hours. Another one is Bokashi composting, which is um, more of an anaerobic method of composting. So you'd want to get like an airtight container. Uh, In that form of composting is cool because you can also compost like meat and dairy. Uh, And so you just toss all that into an airtight container, put some Bokashi grain, uh, and that will kind of like ferment and pickle (laughs) <laughs> your compost and then eventually you can put that in your garden uh, it does have a funky smell to it so you want to put it somewhere where it would break down further like a back into a worm bin or you can do like um an open air compost so you just need like um if you want to do it quickly i would say like a three foot by three foot like space and then you'd put your brown material and then your 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 green waste so like your table scraps and then you just like will aerate it so like flip it over every once in a while and that will break down uh, into something that you could use. Cool. I think those are all like really good suggestions going from really simple, right? The carrot tops, the mm-hmm. banana water to mm-hmm. full on composting, uh, which I would imagine mm-hmm. takes, you know, at least a good month or so, right? For a month or more to mm-hmm. for that whole entire process to really uh, work out. Cool. I do want to talk about actually uh, the like wedding and photography kind of stuff, kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, So I know that you used to run a wedding and photography company called uh, Dungji, right? Uh, Dungji, yeah. Yeah, so tell me a little bit how like that sort of came to be in terms of like wanting to start your own company. Yeah, so um, when I went to UCSB, I found one of my lifetime life partners uh victoria hunger for victoria um and we've um went to school wanting to do film media we have a lot of similar um passions and alignments and viewpoints so we did our uh, we filmed in cambodia together and we continued to, to work together on various filming projects and started our own company um so dungy media and yeah we did it we did wedding photography for eight years, 10 years. Um, we've since retired. It was actually, I think, a time because we have both been dig- getting deep into other interests like permaculture. Um, you can find them at Permaculture Parent on IG and TikTok. Nice, and nice. Um, they bought some property up in um, Washington. And then I've started doing um, getting deeper in my career in a, in a tech company. So we were trying different things and it was a different chapter of our life. So Dungy is short for dork nerd geek. And so we wanted to do a lot of uh, content around that space, but we, I think have grown out of it. We still have a love of video games and tabletop and role-playing. We'll still play D and D when we have the opportunity, but um, it was just a different stage in our lives and our priorities have definitely changed since then. But it was great in that we learned how to start a business. We learned how to market ourselves. We worked with clients doing like the nitty gritty of like sending 
invoices, writing statements of work, working with like UCI and UCR um, and, and small businesses and even just like families and couples for weddings. We did a lot and it was, it was definitely an experimental time. I guess what are kind of the biggest takeaways from that experience? Because eight years is a long time, right? And uh, I'm guessing oh, yeah. this is something yeah. that has uh, that happened kind of right after, I imagine, like the Cambodia trip or right after college, right? Mm-hmm. That, uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine doing it for, for eight years. Uh, but like, what are kind of your biggest takeaways from kind of that whole entire experience? Oh, so many. Um you can start your own business. I encourage everybody to do so. It is hard work. Uh, the grind and the hustle is real, um, but it, and it also will take uh, all of your time. <laughs> Something that people always joke is like, I want to just quit my nine to five and start my own business, which is great, but that also means you'll be working literally 24 seven. So there, <laughs> there's a little bit of drawbacks there, but it was also just amazing to have ownership of what I worked on. And then like, if I ever wanted to like change my style or change um, our approach, it's something that we could do pretty easily. It it didn't require us to um, talk to like a boss or anything, um, which happened a lot. There were definitely times where we made a lot of stylistic changes, um, either with our, either the way we created packages to actually our style of photography. It's so easy to like go with the trends and try to do what everybody else is doing and to then compromise your own artistic style or your own work just so that you could be um, like everybody else. But that's something that we purposely made sure that we did photography in a way that was comfortable to us, that we enjoyed. Um, And that's actually why when we decided to like close the company, it didn't feel like such a heartbreak. It was like, you know, we're at a different creative place in our lives and that's just what we needed to do. Um, Like, in terms of style, Tori, their style is definitely more of a dark and moody. Uh, mine is not as more of a bright and saturated, neither of which are popular at the time in wedding photography, which is like bright and airy. <laughs> right, right, but, right. Uh, and then we, yeah, and that was something we recognized early on. So, and even to this day, I have friends that ask like, hey, can you shoot our wedding? I'm like, yeah, but make sure you like my style. And like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so. Um, if you are looking for a wedding photographer, like you have to look at their work and make sure that it's something that you like and that you'll enjoy, not just now when it's trendy, but also like down the road. Um, so. Got it. It sounds like it's a, like choosing a wedding style is very personal to the person. Right. And like, it sounds oh, yeah. like your advice is like, don't just necessarily do what's on trend. Like if you, if you're kind of lukewarm about yeah. it, but it's on trend, like really find the specific mm-hmm. niche of how you want you know, whatever that special day Mm -hmm. or that special moment to be portrayed. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, it's Uh, interesting to see like how a photographer would take a picture of the same subject. It's vastly different in terms of like color, viewpoints, uh, perspective. So yeah, highly encourage that for anybody who's in the market looking for wedding photography. Oh, I'm I'm sure there, you know, these last past two years, right? Like with the pandemic and, uh, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, they've had to postpone weddings. Uh, postpone uh, mm-hmm. weddings and stuff like that. Like, there's a there's a pretty high markup for a lot of different wedding and engagement services now, just because there's a big line and a huge backlog. Mm-hmm. Uh, totally. One thing that I wanted yeah. to ask uh, was, you know, you mentioned that you and your partner had differences in style, right? Uh, so I guess mm-hmm. when someone came to you or your partner, was it like, hey, Danny? is closer to this style. So Danny can kind of, do you yep. want to take this on and take care of it? And so you kind of just split yep. uh, the styles up based off of what was what was more preferred. A hundred percent. Yeah. And sometimes it wasn't even the, the, the client was, was sure. Like usually we talked with them or like they would have to ask them like what they, which what, what part, what of our work that they enjoy. Um, and that usually can help us figure out like who would make, who would make more sense in leading that particular project. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, I don't know if you would happen to know this, but, you know, when you talk to people, whether they were your clients or just people who have gotten uh, wedding photos or engagement photos or wedding photos and stuff like that, you know, what are some of the regrets that they had and if they could do it all over again? Like, what are the the kind of the common things that you kind of hear 
uh, in terms of making sure that they could have, they were to do it again, what would they do differently from a photography uh, sort of standpoint? Hmm. For my own clients, it's like, oftentimes it's not having enough time, like allocating enough time for those formals, um, especially like formal families. And sometimes that's something that we, I remember we we're just like, well, let's make sure, or we'll kind of like, catch you whenever we can um because you know, it's always surprising how long those things can take because it's so easy to to get um pulled away by other people on your day out of so that's something that sometimes even for me i'm like i wish we had more time but if we can get what you can get that's you know the day is only so long and you also want to spend it with family it's an interesting it's always a juggling act with that one sorry can you explain the time allocation a little bit more with family like what are some examples that uh, you were talking about so for example yeah yeah so um, in the beginning, I would say this definitely affected us because we weren't as experienced is like, um, is making sure that we have photos, like um, the core photos of like bride and groom with their mom, with her mom, bride and groom with his mom, well, one with like the grandma, one with like the siblings. And after a ceremony, it's easy for people and guests to want to pull away the bride and groom to other directions um and so we after from our experience we're like hey i would recommend you have a sheet of paper of like what are all the combinations that you want assign somebody on your bridal party whether it be your uh somebody in your bridal party or your sister or your sibling to like call out these people like all right this is the order okay right. we need grandpa joe and like grandma martha next we need this person next um which definitely I think helps too when it's somebody that is familiar with the family, familiar with the guests, um, because it can be, uh, I don't mind yelling. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> it's right. Sometimes a little hard when, when you don't know when you don't know the person, uh, and also just like I being able to identify like who's missing, um, that's all that was always helpful. So that's something that I remember in the beginning was always like really chaotic, and then once we provided that kind of guidance to folks, that definitely helped. Got it. Uh, when it comes to the price, right, of uh, mm -hmm. photography, whether it's engaged, well, it's, let's talk about engagements, right, engagement shoots, because I feel like mm -hmm. those are the ones that are, like, really special. Uh, not to say that the wedding ones aren't mm -hmm. special, uh, because, like, those will be documented, but I feel like with the mm -hmm. engagement shoots, uh, the couple gets to kind of choose uh kind of what style they want right like a, a location mm -hmm. that's you know a little bit farther or removed uh from uh the wedding venue uh so mm -hmm. i just kind of want to get your kind of top tips in terms of sort of what to look for when you know deciding upon a uh a photographer to do engagement shoots but also like when looking at mm -hmm. like price and you know logistics like what are some of the project management stuff that people kind of need to <laughs> keep in mind. Yeah, some people, there are some people that will opt out of the engagement shoot. I actually highly encourage to do an engagement shoot with your photographer, um, just so you can get comfortable with like um, how to work with them, how to pose with them, because they're literally the last person you're going to see when you're single before you're married. Um, so having, I think, a really good relationship with your photographer and so that you can also convey your wants and needs on the day of. Uh, it's very helpful and doing a pra essentially doing a practice round with the engagement session um, can be really helpful and help build that camaraderie and open communication. Uh, but also just like um, if a good, I think also a good photographer will also make you feel really comfortable in yourself and in what you're doing because a lot of people, it's their first time ever doing a photo shoot and right. you could feel like really intimidated by it. You could also just, you're, depending on your level of confidence, feel, you know, have a lot of, like where you have, um, have a lack of self-esteem or feeling unattractive, ABCD, it could be a whole plethora of things. And I think doing an engagement shoot can unearth and help work through a lot of those things, uh, which is also sometimes on your own time. It's, um, you know, you have an hour or two on your own while it's like on the day of your wedding, there's going to be a lot of chaos and a lot of things going on. So getting that experience from doing uh, an engagement shoot is really helpful. In terms of locations, your photographer will always have like, locations and um, suggestions if you don't have any yourself. I always say that like, you know, pick a place that's really meaningful to you 
um, because then it has a better story. It's easier also to like find locations. Like if you wanted to take, if you are college sweethearts and you guys go to your old uh, campus, you know, taking pictures of where you first met or where you had your first date, I think those can be uh, really meaningful moments um, than just going by the beach. But if you love the beach and it's pretty, that's cool too. Um, but I personally love having those beautiful photo shoots. Uh, there is this one story that I remember, and it's actually at a grocery store that I shop at in uh, the East Bay called Berkeley Bowl. And what happened is this mm -hmm. couple, uh, they uh, they enjoyed going to Berkeley Bowl a lot. Uh, I don't know if they met there or not. I, I forgot the article like specifically, but apparently they had uh, yeah. requested to this grocery store. Uh, it's kind of like an independent uh, grocery uh, store that has like mm -hmm. organic foods, like decent amount of like Asian food selection and stuff like that to open up early mm -hmm. just for them so that they can do their engagement shoot Aww. in um, so a cute. grocery store. So that I remember the, the photos were like, they were on the cart, right? Uh, like getting pushed around mm -hmm. or like, you know, next to the fruit and grow, you know, the fruit aisles and stuff like that, or just using the aisles for mm -hmm. more depth perception. Um, I thought that was kind of really clever. Mm -hmm. Or if it's like, you know, there's some funny stuff too, like, you know, check out, um, you know, the checkout aisles and stuff like that, like going on the conveyor belts and things like that. So um, definitely agree Love with, um, and I, I can post that article, you know, obviously, you know, in the link below or just kind of wherever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thought that was really interesting and creative. So it sounds like, you know, all the stuff focusing around something that's meaningful to you. Um, and it's kind of like, what is your style? It sounds really important just because mm -hmm. uh, you want it to be unique to your story as a couple. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Uh, aside from, I guess, weddings and like engagement shoots, uh, you know, people do take pictures all the time right? Like whether it's for oh, yeah. dating profiles, whether it's, you know, friend trips or uh, just, you know, really important moments in life, or maybe it's not even really important. Maybe it's just an Instagram story where it's like super disposable. Like what are some mm -hmm. of your top tips as someone who's been in the photography business for, you know, like eight years or so? Uh, like how <laughs> do you make yourself look good kind of in any environment um like what are some really basic stuff like to basic things to make you kind of like look your best oh yeah don't be afraid to take up space there's that's my biggest one i did that i'm guilty of that uh, much earlier on in my life where like the second i see a camera i kind of cave in and i try to make myself look smaller um and, and i think in my mind i was like i'll look skinnier but really i think um being comfortable in in taking up that space and I find it's funny um I've kind of I've I've done the opposite where like I'm, I just wanted to be expressive and be over the top and ridiculous and I'll do that for my clients too to kind of help them break out of their comfort is if I, if I notice them just caving in and feeling very uncomfortable I'll be like let's do some stretches let's like yell let's nice, um nice. put your hands up in the air and scream uh, try to take up that space and then that usually uh, help you um, feel a little bit more comfortable um, being with the camera afterwards. So that's that's one of the first things I'd recommend is like, um, don't be afraid to take up space. And if you need to yell or if you need to act wild um, in the first instance so that you can calm yourself down or, or feel a little bit more comfortable and normal afterwards, um, that's an option. Um, that would be one of my first the biggest advice. Um, and then what else? Sure. I'm really big on lighting, y'all. Um, <laughs> Sorry, say that last part. Kind again? of like recognizing uh, lighting, so making sure that there's like a light source um, that you can work with, um, kind of work with the natural light and existing lights that you have, whether it be the sun itself or it could be a neon sign, it could be street lamps, um, whenever possible. Try to look for those uh, elements to work off of, and um, I, I I usually try to find. And it, sometimes I'll also, from that, find ways that where the light can be softened because the direct sun can be really strong. Um, but you can also consider things, light can bounce on things. So like on a, a white wall, the light can also bounce. Or if you're wearing a blouse that's white, that light can also be used to uh, bounce light and, and fill in any harsh shadows and stuff like that. But yeah, to take better pictures, I also just recommend, you know, 
take a lot. We live in a digital age. You can take True. a thousand pictures. Uh, you're not going to go through a, a lot of film. You're going to have to go and cull and, and delete a lot of photos. Um, but that definitely is something that will help is to take a lot. And I, you know, some people will joke about that where like, oh, you got to take like 50 selfies to get the right one. I'm like, but that's, that's true. <laughs> that's something. True. Um, yeah, and then if that. you review them, reviewing, reviewing them definitely helps. I remember, um, cause we, we definitely had to grow our team when we were doing our photography business. And I would say that the photographers that grew the fastest and improved the most were the ones that went back and reviewed their work. Um, oftentimes, uh, like if we get a second shooter, they will give you the raw files and then the main shooter, the primary shooter can edit them so that the, the styling and the lighting is cohesive. Um, but if that photographer just, just cans it off and doesn't review them, uh, they don't grow as a photographer quite as quickly as if they were to review them themselves. So take a lot of photos, but also take the time to look through them, review them and think of like how ways you can make them look better. Cause even when you take a bad photo, even I do this, I'm like, man, that's a shitty photo. Like, I'm never going to do it that way again. Right. Um, you kind of <laughs> recognize it because then you'll kick yourself in the butt and be like, oh man, I've done this like 10 times. I wasted my time reviewing this. I, I, I'm going to remember next time. Um, so that, I think that definitely helps. I think one of the things um, that I might've learned from you actually is uh, taking photos in different aspect ratios. So let's say for example, if someone... Mm-hmm you know, it's like, Hey, can you take my photo? Right? Like they hand you your phone yeah. or their phone. It's just like, okay, take it in portrait, take it in landscape. Uh, <laughs> and that's something now that I always do. Like, and sometimes people are like, wait, why are mm-hmm. you doing that? It's just like, well, there's different aspect ratios. And I think both of us being marketers, it's like, oh, you want mm-hmm. your nine by 16s. You want your 16 by nines. Right? <laughs> like, you want options yeah. in terms of like what other, I'm assuming like what other light sources you know, you can capture in and, you know, giving more mm-hmm. optionality is usually always uh, a good thing. Yeah. In today's age where, you know, people are also posting uh, portrait ratios and in, in some of their Instagram stories and posts, uh, it's, I think, helpful to always have that option. Um, and like, it's funny because I definitely, I think you probably have learned it for me because I'll, it's kind of obvious. Exactly. You yeah. yeah, yeah. Camera. <laughs> and um I also give you more flexibility in editing. For me, sometimes I'll I'll be able to like cut in and zoom in and like it gives. I think it just also gives you more flexibility. Um, and because I also do marketing, sometimes I just need that copy space. I just wish there's a little more space. So if it was shot horizontally, uh, then I have that extra space to work with. So it's nice. Yeah, I would say with taking like sixteen by nines and nine by sixteens portrait and landscapes, especially mm-hmm. if you're taking it a you know in a more scenic place. Um, it just mm-hmm. gives a little bit different focus, right. In terms of like, sometimes you want the mm-hmm. focus to be on the environment and the people, and then like the people are kind of just in that environment. And then if you're obviously taking it through mm-hmm. portrait, like you want it to be the, the people, right. That are in the picture to be kind of mm-hmm. the center of focus. So, uh, I think that is, you know, something that I think uh, hopefully the people that I do do that for do appreciate it and have fond memories to twenty <laughs> minutes by. Uh, I do want to move on kind of to our last kind of main topic and uh, it's mainly around house renovation and, Mm. you know, you let's, let's take it back a little bit in terms of, you know, deciding on buying a house, right? Like, you know, there's different schools of thought of like, Oh, I want to rent a house. Maybe people want to buy a house. Like, you know, how did you determine that buying a house uh, with you, for you and your partner, right, was the right move for mm-hmm. you? Yeah, um, I will say that I'm very lucky and I come from a privilege to be able to buy a house. Okay. Um, and, you know, it, 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 that is a decision. I don't think that everybody needs to and should own a house. It, there's, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of upkeep. They say that you should always invest. You need to reinvest like a one percent of your house value back in your house a year in terms of repairs, because um, repairs are going to happen. Um, and it's not, sometimes not big. It's sometimes it's little things like a dent in the drywall. You'll get a draft, or sometimes it's big things where you need to replace the, the HVAC system. So there are going to be costs that you need to consider um, when buying a home. It's not just like the home itself and the down payment. Um, so it'll always be things that break down. My own parents, um, they have gutted an entire home and um, 
pretty much built it from the ground back up. And, and now it's been a little over 10 years and there are things that now are breaking because that's just how things happen. Um, even as little well as like the sink isn't draining as well as it used to be with everything or like there's cracks in the ceiling because we live in like an earthquake prone zone. So, um, so renting sometimes it can be a better option if you don't, uh, if you don't want to worry about the cost of repairs or the time it takes for repairs um, and dealing with things like that. Do you think that, cause I know you have a huge green thumb, right? Like when you're rent, if you're renting a house, right? Would you be able to do all the gardening stuff um, specifically kind of in the, the outdoor space? Like, I would, I don't know if you know, but is that like something typically that you're able to kind of do right as a renter, mm -hmm. uh, especially with like, uh, you know, gardening in, you know, the dirt or let's say uh, yeah. kind of building your stuff around it. Yeah, it will it will depend on like the, the place that you're renting your landlord, they may have different roles. Um, if you are ten of your opponents moving often, like I remember when I was in college, we moved pretty much every year. Um, you can also grow things in like grow bags, raised beds, things that are collapsible um, that you can move and transport. So there's a lot of options for renters or people that live in like townhomes or condos or might not have a big piece of land. Um, you don't need as much space to grow anything. And it's really cool because there are now a lot of tools and resources where you can grow like hydroponically on your desktop or you can get a tower uh, and have that inside your home and not even need to have uh, land or patio or balcony outside. Um, so there's a lot of different ways in, to, to grow, which is really cool. Got it. Uh, taking it back, right, to house renovation, uh so you decided you and your partner decided to buy a place right like mm -hmm. i know from just firsthand experience and actually having visited your place it is very humongous well i would say probably what like four thousand what the yard is like four thousand square feet or something like that or am i so so, my, so the, the for those of you that go by uh square foot feet which apparently is not every state um, it's 8,000 square foot. It's the size of a lot, which to um, people who grew up in uh, Southern California or LA or Orange County, that's actually a pretty big uh, piece of land. There's actually a lot of other homeowners that I know where their lot is like 3,000, 4,000. Um, so arguably mine's double the, the space. Um, but I also know there are people in Minnesota and Florida with like three times the amount of yard space. So it's always, you know, it's, to, to somebody who has like um, a patio, having my plot of land has been amazing. But for me, there are also moments where I'm like, I wish I had an acreage. Um, Tori also goes by a permaculture pyramid. They have like 20 acres in Washington, which is like so much land. <laughs> so Yeah. I don't know how she's ever like going to scour there, all that but... land, right? Or just even do something with it. Like <laughs> half of it will probably be like untouched, I would imagine. Yeah which is totally fine too. Um, but yeah, for myself, I knew I wanted um, a bunch of land because I wanted to essentially build kind of like a food forest and um, and it, it was hard to find. So I was like, as, as big as I can, but I was being realistic. I to Even getting a, like a, anything with any sizable backyard, even if it was like a couple hundred square feet, I was like, that would be fine. I'll make it work. Um, but we were very lucky um, not only to uh, have something that was this big, but it's a south facing yard. So there's a lot of things that I was looking for that this house like fulfilled. So like it's south facing, so we get a lot of sun in the backyard. If when, I, when we put in solar, um, it's gonna be a great spot uh, where it is in terms of its orientation. And it's gonna look good, which is nice. Um, it, there's, there's a lot of those small things that were really important to me. The, the neighborhood is have has wide streets, so that can have a lot of parking and have like community events, like seed swaps and like clothing swaps and stuff like that, which I want to do once the house is done. So those are all things that we were looking for, and we were in a unique situation in that um, we were actually looking for a house for ten over ten months. Uh, like formally putting in offers to places and getting rejected um, all the time. And with sometimes offers like 50 to like 80K over asking, which is like wild, um, but was the market 
at the time um, and our particular property, uh, it was being sold by the owner and um, he took, he went on the listing for, I think maybe a couple hours and took it off because he was getting so many calls from uh, realtors and um, contractors who wanted to like flip the home. And it was funny when I called, he was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not um, working with any agents or anything. And we were like, no, 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 we, we're actually like normal people <laughs> that would Got like it. to buy your home and live in your home. And um, we met up, we connected, we, and I, I was very, we were very lucky in that him and his family, they really liked us and they, we had a, a lot of similar interests. They were really into gardening um, and do it and like do it yourself kind of mentality. And so I honestly think that like, that was the only reason that we were able to get this house um, kind of sheer luck, but also in terms of like interest and yeah, we did it, went without any realtors and I we just printed out a form on, on like Microsoft Word. <laughs> it was like, like two pages. Uh, we both signed it and then we went, went through the process together. That's pretty amazing because most people usually get a real estate agent to represent them. Mm -hmm. Like what was your decision not to use mm -hmm. a real estate agent? I think it was a combination of like, because he didn't want to use an agent. And then I've had family members that actually have done the same thing where they didn't get an agent involved. It's like, it's, um, so long as we like we agree on the terms and everything like that, it's not too hard to do. You can find stuff online. It's great. <laughs> That's true. We did have uh, to get like a notary like for the final paperwork, but yeah. Got it. Sounds good. Uh, I do want to move on to mm -hmm. the actual uh, renovation piece, right, of the house. So mm -hmm. uh, from my understanding is that, you know, you have this, you know, uh, huge yard right that you know is ripe for mm -hmm. opportunity for your garden uh, you also have stuff inside the house that i believe you wanted to also renovate as well so actually mm -hmm. funny thing is uh for those who are you know you know watching uh, i'm going to describe like danny's background uh, or for those who are listening i'm going to describe danny's background a bit you can tell that uh, there mm -hmm. are pieces of the wall and a window in the background, but there's uh, mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, support pillars uh, or temporary, I'm mm -hmm. assuming temporary support pillars that are in place. So mm -hmm. she is in the middle of gutting out her place as we do are doing this interview. Yep. Yeah, we uh, wanted to take some of the walls down for more of an open concept. Uh, it's really funny because I know that during COVID, there were folks that were putting walls back up uh, so they could have more privacy and do calls and and not have such a echoey environment but we still wanted to have an open concept for ourselves i like cooking and i like being able to talk to my partner across the room or across the house so we decided we continue to decide that we're going to take down the walls and it's it's made a dramatic difference um when the when the walls came down i was like this house looks so huge <laughs> and it's a normal it's a very our, our home's only a thousand square feet it's um to for those that live in apartments that sounds like a lot to some folks that have much bigger homes it sounds very tiny but for for the two of us it's perfect um and if we were to have children or something i think it'd still be the right size got it Talk to me about some of the things that uh you've had to tear down because i think honestly that's the most exciting and amazing stuff um like i know you've done roof work you've you know uh coordinated cutting down a tree you took down a mm -hmm. uh like almost like a, almost a one-story shed right i don't know if it's one story but like kind of close two story to shed, it yeah. a little bit two story oh two story shed <laughs> um and you kind of yeah, like so did you do, did you do a lot of these these things by yourself right or with your and with your partner yeah yeah so we had so when we bought the property there was um two sheds one of them was two stories um and then there was a playhouse that was two stories and um none of it was permitted so we were like oh we have to take it down um they were stru structurally sound though um it was built on concrete they had the correct um, foundation i arguably might be overbuilt because there were a lot of it was pretty strong it could fit like we could have thrown a party in that playhouse and then <laughs> on top of that shed and would have been fine um had a little dance off um so we definitely we wanted to take it down though because um we wanted to have more room for the vegetable garden 
Um, and it just wasn't going to work with like the food forest concept. And we, we didn't have any need ourselves for those sheds. So, and the playhouse, we were torn for a little bit. We're like, oh, would this be so fun for our cousins and stuff? But there were like birds making nests in there and a lot of dead animals that we found when we were cleaning it up. So we decided like that was the right thing to do. Um, the pieces of wood that looked still really good, we reused it actually in our garden. We did, we were told that everything was uh, was not treated, um, so not treated wood or anything. So, but we did, did a test. So there's little kits you can get online to see if there's like any arsenic or any um, wood treatments in there, and they all came out clean. So we used them in the vegetable garden. So most of it, if it didn't have any like termite damage, was reused uh, to great, make all of the raised beds. Um, and uh, we still have a lot left over uh, that we'll probably use for other things. And then, um, yeah, those sheds were also built on concrete. So we had to jackhammer and pull out a lot of concrete and rebar. Um, the plan was for um, myself and my partner to do it together, but he actually got into a, a bicycle accident where he uh, was on the bike path and had to dodge some folks that were walking on it and then um, injured his shoulder uh, or his elbow. And so most of the jackhammering was done by myself and some friends, but all, yeah, that was a lot harder than I thought it was. Okay. Talk, um, talk to me about, we got it done. Okay. It just, sorry, go ahead. Oh, jackhammer. Yeah. I was going to ask, uh, talk to me about the jackhammer, right? Cause most people, when they see someone on a jackhammer, it's usually like they're doing road construction. It's a dude or maybe <laughs> I would say most of the time it's a dude in a hard hat, right? On mm -hmm. top of a jackhammer and there's just kind of people su supervising. Like talk to me about that experience <laughs> of like using a jackhammer, like one, just the fact to, that you're using a jackhammer probably seems intim a little intimidating, right? Cause it's just like this big heavy piece of equipment. And like, where did you kind of like, is this your first time using a jackhammer? Have you used it before? Have yeah, you like, yeah. watched other people, mm -hmm. right? To really build that confidence. Cause I can't imagine that someone's just like, I'm just gonna go home Depot. I'm just going to use a jackhammer and like, you know, maybe I'll look up some <laughs> stuff on YouTube. Cause I'm sure there's a lot of safety things that you have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can in fact rent a jackhammer from like home Depot. They have a road to department. The They're really nice. Um, we actually were very lucky and I had a friend whose dad was in construction and had a lot of tools and it offered if we needed anything to that we could borrow it. So we borrowed theirs, which actually ended up being a great decision because uh, renting does go by the hour and by the day and it would have been very expensive to to do the jackhammering with rent, a rental. Um, but luckily because of my friend, we were able to kind of do it at our own pace. Super helpful, especially in the dead of summer, being outside in 100 degree weather, jackhammering is rough, I would say at least. So yeah, and I didn't have an experience. Um, the biggest tip that my friend gave me is just to uh, make sure I had enough uh, slack with the extension cord to make sure it was always out of the way. Um, but everything else we kind of figured, we watched a couple of YouTube videos and just improved as we were going along. Um, there were things that we learned like spraying water so you don't have like as much dust and dirt in the air. Definitely wear goggles, definitely wear gloves. I, we have hard hats just because I was overly cautious, which has helped us in so many cases when taking down the two-story shed and um, and playhouse. <laughs> um, highly recommend all the safety gear and wearing long sleeves and pants. Um, there's actually funny, we documented some of this process. So one of my buddies, he's just shirtless and in basketball shorts, um, jackhammering. But I was like, no, I'm just gonna be extra cautious. <laughs> Um, but there's so many resources out there on YouTube. It's um, if you if you wanted to give it a shot, you definitely can. Um, who knows? Maybe I'll do a little tutorial video or something. <laughs> I mean, maybe you'll make a great TikTok out of it because it's just like <laughs> I can't imagine people thinking about, oh, I went on a jackhammer and like you know for the first time, and here's how it went. I feel like that would be a great premise for uh, a TikTok video. Oh, okay. Noted. I'll find that footage put it together. <laughs> uh, talk to me about um, power tools. And like, I feel like with power tools, you kind of have to like grow into them a little bit just because like mm -hmm. uh, a power tools obviously usually involve like the drill and like the different drill bits. And like, it, there's a lot of customizability uh, that you can attach onto there. Yep. Um, what are some like, I, I guess, tips when using 
like trying to find like the right uh, bit, right? Or like the type of bit that you should use with your power tools. Because I feel like power tools are one of the most versatile uh, tools that you, whether you're a renter, right? Or even a homeowner, like mm -hmm. I feel like you need, you should have at least a power tool kit um, yeah. to, to just handle like everyday things. Like even if you're putting together Ikea furniture, it's going to make your life so much yep. easier by, you know, using so a power tool easier. kit. Uh, so yeah. what, what are some tips with using like power tools? Yeah, I actually, my first one was a Ryobi like drill that I got. It's so cheap. Ryobi is a great cheap entry level uh, set of power tools that you can get. I actually had that in college and used that heavily to assemble and disassemble Ikea furniture because as much as you can do with little hex key, so much faster when you have a drill with the, the, the hex drill bit. Um, and I actually, I feel it's really funny. I'm like not uh, a snob about my power tools. Um, um, Charlie and I decided we went with Rigid instead of DeWalt mostly because of, I think, the um, the warranties and the lifetime batteries um, that came along with it. Um, Charlie's really big on warranties. And so uh, we ended up going with them instead of DeWalt. But I know there are some people that are like, they swear by a brand, brand loyalist to DeWalt or Milwaukee and stuff like that. Um, but for me, if it gets the job done, that's really all that matters. Um, and so that's probably the biggest thing. Another thing is like, it's so easy to get caught up in like buying the like the pack of like everything, like the combo where it has all the tools, do whatever you need into one pack, which is like, if you know 100% that you're gonna use them, by all means get it. Um, but for us, we found that like, we didn't need everything at once. It would have been so expensive to get everything at once. Um, we, and it, it was helpful for me to kind of learn new tools as I needed them. Um, Cause then you'd also figure out like in what situations can you get away with just using a miter saw or like a table saw and then what scenarios would you want to use like um, a reciprocating saw? Cause we had the reciprocating saw first and I was like, can I just do everything with this? Holy crap. I mean, okay. you, could, you could, but um, it's it definitely gets, yeah, some things get easier when you have the right tools. Um, so we've definitely been slowly growing our arsenal. We recently got a buzz saw um, for a couple items taking uh, as we're demoing. Um, they're very, it's very helpful. But yeah, that helps with costs. You just get it as you grow. I would it's do this, it's the same way I would recommend building your kitchen uh, <laughs> pots and pan set. Kind of get it as you as you grow and, and get no skills. Got it. So let's say for example, you know, you're renting or you're in a uh like a not a fixer upper but already like a you know pretty nice house right like that doesn't need mm -hmm. any fixing up and you just need to do common everyday tasks right like what are the top tools to have in your arsenal like maybe not obviously like uh like huge humongous tools like what are like really simple things that uh can solve most problems whether it's like you know yeah. a nail in the, the wall or like a loose screw mm -hmm. or you know, want to bolt on, right? Like a new, uh, yeah. I don't know, something, right? Like what are the, what are the most simple and accessible tools that anyone can use for most everyday problems? Yeah. Like a hand, so pliers, a hammer and a drill can get you, I would say like 80% of most of your tasks. Um, and that's actually, I think the kit that I had. Um, so the hammer and the, the pliers, um, and the wrench all came from like an Ikea kit from the 2000s. I know I exactly which one you're talking there. about because it came in like an <laughs> orange like case uh, with the yeah. hammer. Yeah, yep. the, the screwdriver, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. which one you're talking about. And then and then a drill. And like I honestly can say that that gets pretty much almost everything that you'd ever need. Um, for when I was switching from apartments to apartments throughout college, that was pretty much all I needed. Awesome. Uh, also, like I think a um, tape measure is very helpful, <laughs> and some gloves. But those can be auxiliary if you if you want to. I think an underrated one is a uh, painter's tape, as well. Um, not really oh, yeah. a tool per se, but just for mm -hmm. labeling things across the board. <laughs> Always good to have. Mm -hmm. Doesn't ruin your tape, or it doesn't ruin your wall, or your paint, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also good. A good one. Um, kind of want to wrap things up a little bit. I have some 
really fun kind of off the topic uh, kind of questions for you. Uh, what would be your top five girl group bands of all time? Oh, that's very specific. Oh, girl groups, girl groups, girl groups. It you could mean, be from Spice Asia. Girls, yeah, it could be from oh, Asia. Could, it could be for here. I must say, could is it like performance group? Could I say say like Sailor Moon's Cole Sailor Scouts? Is that a I whole mean, thing? You, I mean, like um, you could say so whichever. Purely yeah. on music. But yeah, you that, could do okay, the whole I'm aesthetic if you want to. <laughs> um, okay, so Spice Girls, aesthetic. Sailor Moon aesthetic, Spice Girls. That's just like childhood. You gotta, you gotta include that. Um, Man, 3LW was playing on MTV Classic at my work today. For some reason, that's popping up in my mind. Um, I also am a big fan of 21. Uh, it's a K-pop group that I've enjoyed in my youth. Um, Very nice. I feel like because of that, I also have to mention Blackpink because I have seen them live at Coachella. But they, I always like go back to 21. The sound, the vibes, the energy. It reminds me of my youth. <laughs> so, okay. Blackpink, um, not so much? More 21. I'm more, more of a 21. 21- fan yeah um what else who else anyone you have one more so you have spice girls 3lw to anyone and blackpink so one more oh i'm missing oh oh man that's too mm, i don't know so ah uh, right now okay so last year in covid <laughs> Uh, there's a group called Refund Sisters. That's Lee Hyori, Kwasa, yes, I, My uh, sister Jesse. actually introduced oh, yeah. me to them recently. <laughs> that was that was a that was a special project concept that I really enjoyed. It was basically um, uh, a female artist from different age groups, from as young as in their twenties to as somebody in their fifties. Fifties, um, yeah. And they all looked amazing. Yeah, all looked amazing. They all slayed. Um, they're not as iconic because it's only been like we've only done like one song really but I, I really enjoyed that and I I binge watched a lot of that stuff so that was really enjoyable so I will say Refund Sisters Refund Sisters very good choice mm-hmm. um, my last question is uh, who is someone that you could introduce me to that you could bring on to the pod um, that you think would be uh, an interesting person to interview ooh Let's see. Depends on the topic. I feel like... Like, what topic do you think is the most interesting, like, that hasn't really been discussed about, but, like, you would want them to have the platform to talk about it? Because I've met... Because I mentioned Tori so much, I would say they would be really good because if you were to go into permaculture more, um, that would be a really good resource. They would be a really good resource. Um... Who could I introduce? Man, do I know? Am I that? Do I know anybody cool? Everybody, everybody I know is kind of cool. Um, could be anything. I think that that's was, good. Right, Tori, Tori, Tori is also <laughs> a very good answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, she's also a really mm-hmm. amazing person. Uh, very, I feel like similar drives and ambitions um, mm-hmm. to you. Uh, well, I think yeah. that's going to wrap and it up. super accessible. Uh, yeah, super acceptable. I think that's going to wrap it up for today's episode. Uh, it was a really good one. A lot of really good information. Uh, and mm-hmm. really want to thank you, Danny, for joining me on this pod. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hopefully it was interesting and y'all that are listening or watching enjoyed. Yeah, so you can definitely, you know... Uh, check out where to follow Danny if you have questions about photography, home renovation, um, as well as uh, any gardening tips. Uh, Danny is your woman. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'll catch you later. I'm still learning. <laughs>